What's going on? Phil from Phil Will Expose. Today's episode, I got an extremely special guest who goes by the name of Jed Johnson. Most of you guys already know who he is, but to those of you who don't, welcome aboard. Welcome aboard to the Skype call. I'm extremely happy to have him on the channel today and I'm sure he's very happy to be here as well. So how are you doing, man? Dude, I'm doing good. I uh, really appreciate you having me on. Can't wait to do this. Yeah, man, no problem, man. So uh, instead of me introducing you, why don't you introduce yourself, tell, tell everybody... How long you been lifting, you know, uh, how much you weigh, how long, uh, some of your best lifts, just some basic stuff. Okay. Uh, Jed Johnson, they call me Napalm. I run a website called dieselcrew.com. I have a, uh, a YouTube channel that's just my name, J-E-D-D-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And uh, <clears throat> mainly these days I'm known for grip strength training and grip competitions. But over the years, I've I've done all forms of training. Started lifting, started lifting real serious in like 1999, and before that, I'd really only done uh, lifting for baseball and basketball. So once I was in college, I played baseball two years at Mansfield University. Once I got done with that, I was I was mainly interested in bodybuilding to become a pro wrestler. So. I did a bunch of lifting, you know, that was mainly centered around bodybuilding and strength training. I guess my first, uh, my, my first interest in pure strength training was for Olympic weightlifting. Started doing that in 2002, if I recall, then started, uh, trying, trying other things as, as I went along. So put some more emphasis on powerlifting. Also, in 2003, got involved in strongman training, so we got our got a hold of some odd objects like atlas stones and kegs. We got a log, farmers implements, things along those lines. So it was really cool, and I loved doing overhead press. That was that was what was really fun for me in the Olympic lifts. And then found out that I was pretty good with the log and axle overhead lifts and strongman. And we signed up for a a strongman competition that was going to take place in August of 2003. And then I found out about a grip strength competition that was going to take place in September. So I figured that grip was really important in the strongman. So it probably made sense to train for both grip and strongman. Um, you know, along the lines, uh, I picked up uh, an interest in feats of strength, like the old time strongman feats, like ripping Decks of cards, tearing phone books. You can see yeah. in the background. You All know? that stuff, man. That uh, awesome. Odd object lifting, you know, one arm barbell lifting, things along those lines. Steel bending. And uh, really, I got a, completely away from Olympic lifting and a little bit of power lifting to support my strongman stuff. I did strongman from 2003 to 2006. Some back injuries caught up with me, so I... I just got out of strongman competitions. Um, I'll still do, to this day, I'll still do some strongman lifts. Like we just worked the log back into the program here recently. So mm -hmm. doing some overhead lifting with the log. And um, I've got a couple guys that are interested in coming up and trying uh, the Atlas Stones out. So might end up doing that once the weather breaks and we can get outside and do that. Um, but uh, for the most part, Really, the only competition that I do these days is for grip sport and uh, just mainly working on different grip strength, feats of strength. So uh, looking at uh, plate pinching, block weights, uh, challenge dumbbells, like um, old-time strongman dumbbells, and uh, especially inch dumbbell is probably one of the ones that I'm most uh, well-known for these days as far as a, a grip challenge. And then also different block weights. So um, nice. that's in a nutshell. That's that's my lifting history up until this point. So I've been following your channel for since maybe around 2013. Mm -hmm. I know you've been around forever, but uh, that's when I personally found out about it. But what really turned you on in, in like the performance uh, aspect of stuff as opposed to bodybuilding? Not to say that bodybuilding is you know teach his own. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed, like you're always, um, and that's what's really motivating about watching your videos is that you're always chasing, you know, the performance, you know, like so much, right. so many different feats of strength and you're so, and now you're really diving into this grip stuff or you've been diving into it for a while, but what really gets you going with the performance as opposed to just 
like more aesthetics like all the time. Yeah. So I think a big part of that is the fact that I played baseball from the time I was eight up until I was like 19. So <clears throat> I was used to constantly comp- uh, competing against other people. And then once, once I, once I wrecked my arm in, in college, I was like, what am I going to do with my time? So I wanted to do something that was competitive. So once, you know, after I kind of realized that pro wrestling wasn't going to work for me, uh, I just, I just really needed some kind of competition again. So that's when straw man, uh, came up. So it was, it was something to really set my eyes on and set goals for. And it, you know, I started, I went from in a, in a, in the span of probably two months, I went from lifting five days a week as in a bodybuilding emphasis to like three days a week for strongman because strongman can beat you up quite a bit. And, uh, I just, I wasn't able to recover from my workouts efficiently if I did it more than three days a week. So I had to cut them down, but, um, you know, really any, if I go through a period where I'm not training for either a competition or some kind of feat of strength, it's like vacation. If I just do bodybuilding, like right. if I just go in there and try to get a pump and, and I'm not worried about, you know, trying to push myself to reach a certain number, or have to, I don't have to deal with failure that much anymore Then, uh, you know, that's like a vacation, like to a degree, strength training and especially grip strength training where you're especially if you're trying to do something that maybe you've only done once or only a handful of people have done or maybe something that no one's ever done before you're dealing with a lot of failure so it can get stressful at times so um every once in a while i'll just back off and do some some muscle building stuff but yeah for the most part it's it's geared around major grip strength goals for my training i still do i'll still do a, a a chest day and uh, like a push day and a pull day, and mm-hmm. then eh, I'll, I'll get legs in there sometimes. My back is still questionable sometimes, so I just go by feel with that. But um, you know, for instance, I've got currently I'm working towards um, working up to 150 pound dumbbells for flat dumbbell bench press for a set of 10. That's like my body, my my main body strength right. goal. Right. Um, and for those uh, 20, for, for those of you who are curious, sorry, um, what are your, what's your height and uh, how much do you weigh oh, on average? Yeah, so so I'm about six two, little over six two, and I weigh I probably weigh about two fifty two fifty five most days, so I'm actually trying to cut to two thirty one by June eighth. That's the North American Grip Championships, and uh, I've been that light before, but it's been several years. I, I have competed in at that uh, weight class before. It's uh, 105 kilos, 231 pounds. So that's what I'm working towards now, uh, as far as body weight. And then, of course, nice. the nice. the body composition will will get a lot better too. I was um, I used to be a lot leaner from like 2013 to 2015. I was quite a bit leaner, and then uh, just haven't really paid that much attention to maintaining a strict, disciplined diet over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. No, but still, uh, you know, it still looks badass, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like just somebody who's like, you know, just big and just doing all these crazy feats of strength, you know. Still, um, there's this misconception online of like if somebody's like, you know, 250, that all of a sudden they're unhealthy. And to those people, it's like, have you ever heard of uh, weight classes? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> just because someone's in like a heavier weight class doesn't mean that they're automatically like out of shape. Like they could be in the best shape ever, they just right. happen to be more like husky, you know. If you add if you add in like the, the conditioning and stuff like that, like arguably more fit than most people, you know. Yeah, um, but, yeah. I, I'll tell you when I was even when I was competing at two thirty one, I would have to I would have to suck weight for that, and I'd probably be walking around at like two forty two most times. So I mm-hmm. was, I, you know, I would have to take off ten to twelve pounds in order to get to two thirty one. Yeah. So, um, and you know, at two forty two, I had like a clear six pack. I mean. I I'm not out of shape by any means. It's just I haven't uh, I haven't been watching what I've been eating because uh, just haven't been interested in doing it. I haven't had a goal around that, so now I do. So I've really been uh, 
you know, eat, it's you know, it's not hard. It's like what you're what you're eating and how many calories and stuff like that. It's right, pretty right. basic. Um, it's really just a matter of if you get a craving, you got to curb that craving. So, yeah, um, I think I'll get there. I've got a couple months still, and I'm I'm taking my time. You know, a couple pounds a week. So that's that's yeah. what it's all about. So for everybody who doesn't know, um, why don't you explain grip sport? Because even myself, I don't know. I heard about it for years. But I don't yeah. know, like, the actual definition. Is it? Is it just, like, uh, challenging your grip in a multitude of different ways, like with, uh, you know, ripping, bending, gripping different objects? Mm-hmm. And it's, like, what, competition based on that? Or do they so tell you, you can, what you have to if, work for? Or? If you think, if you take, like, the deadlift of powerlifting – and then combine that with strongman, you've, you've got an idea of what grip sport is. So um, there's usually, it, it tests hand strength. Usually the, the ripping, bending, tearing, that kind of stuff is not in a grip contest. That's If it is, it's going to be in a medley at the end where you've got all kinds of different challenges set before you and you've got to complete them within a time limit. So right. the right. medley in a grip contest is kind of like an odd object uh, medley in strongman where there might be an anchor and a stone and a sandbag and you got to maybe pick them up and carry them across a line within a certain time period with grip sport the medley is all the challenges are set up set up around you on the floor you might have to pick them up and load them onto a platform or it might be an implement that is attached to a loading pin that you bend down grab the handle and then lift it to lock out so that's one event in a grip contest, the, the medley. And it's usually the last because it's very, very demanding. So the first, there's usually four or five events. And usually you'll see grippers in, in grip sports. Right. So have you, do you have any, like, captains of, of crush grippers? Of course, grip of course. Strippers? Yeah. I'm not so, at the three yet, though. <laughs> what's that? I'm not at the 300 yet, though, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, that's no problem. No problem. A lot of people aren't. Um, so usually in grip sport contests, you're able to set the gripper with your off hand and then you have to maintain enough space that you can pass a block through the handles and then you close it down. What that does is it negates some of the hand size uh, advantages that a large handed person would have if you went with like a full open, no set close or a credit card close, which is, which is, Mm -hmm. which is required for the captains of crush certification. So instead of dealing with that wide open gap before closing the gripper down, you're able to set it down to parallel, swipe a small block that measures 20 millimeters between the handles, and then close it down. Okay. And you usually get four attempts with grippers um, in order to get your max close. And um, instead of just having a mess of grippers on the on the table, what we have they're all they're all in order. And they're rated using something called an RGC. And it's a device that holds your gripper in position like this. And then weight is loaded on the top handle with a strap. And eventually, with enough weight, those handles will just touch. And that's the the rating that the gripper gets. So um, we can go into more detail on that, but I just want to talk about grip sport. So usually you have the crushing event, which is grippers. Then there's a pinching event at some point, and there's lots of different pinching events. But basically pinching is where your hands are in this position, fingers opposing the thumb. Then you have a thick bar event usually. So it's something where most people will not get a complete lock with their hands. There's going to be a space in between their thumb and fingers when they're when they're lifting. So it could be an axle, like from Iron Mind, which is about two inches in diameter. It could be something larger, like a crusher, which is two and a half inches diameter. So um, there's usually the crush, the pinch, and the thick bar. Sometimes you'll have a wrist event, or you'll have an inline grip or a vertical grip event. So the wrist event could be sledgehammers, uh, of of some, some sort of sledgehammer event. There could be a bending event. Although, like I said, bending does not usually take place very often in grip sport anymore. Um, the other one, the inline or the vertical grip event, is like a vertical bar or something where when you reach down, your hand is kind of like a doorknob. Right. So if right. you imagine grabbing a doorknob like this, that's the grip you take, only you're in this position with your forearm. 
it's just kind of hard to, to show right now because I'm sitting down, but your elbow would be here, your hand would be below, and then you would grip it like this. With well, so the sledgehammer kind of event. Two... Sorry? Yeah, the sledgehammer yeah. event. What, what's that one like? What do you have to do with that? Um, the, the real common one is called the sledge choke. So you take a 12-pound or a 14-pound sledgehammer, and you mark out every inch increment away from the head until you get to the handle. And then you take a grip. So you... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So you've got your ham your hammer lying on the floor, all right, flat on the floor. You put a coin, a quarter, up on top of the sledgehammer head, and then you grip behind one of those lines, and you have to pick the hammer up and place it on an 18-inch platform without the coin falling off. So oh, wow. it does allow for a degree of tilt, but you have to control how much tilt because if it tilts too much the quarter will slide right off so that's just one you can also just stand there with a sledgehammer and lever it down like this it touches your head you lift it back up there's other events where you have a a, a two-handed sledgehammer that's connected together you lower it down touch your head and come back up there's there's tons of different sledgehammer right. lifts so um not tons but there's you know there's a dozen or so that, that you can do um different different wrist events so yeah so crushing pinching thick bar some kind of wrist or vertical grip and then the medley that's usually the way a grip contest is set up and then you try to lift as much weight or close as big of a gripper as you can in each event and then for each event you end up with a score Right. The way the scoring works, it sounds it sounds somewhat complex, but the way the scoring works, whoever comes in first place gets 100 points. And then whatever their score was, everybody else's score is divided by that score. So their score becomes the denominator on like the bottom of a fraction. So let's say I left 100 and you left 90, right? Mm -hmm. Real easy. 90 divided by 100 is 0.9. Right. So you multiply that by a hundred and uh, by yeah by a hundred and you get ninety points, right? So we do that for every event, and then whatever percentage you end up getting in each event is all added together, and you get an aggregate score, and that's how the that's how the standings are decided by the end of the contest. Now we also have weight classes, so you know it's not really fair for someone that weighs. 110 pounds to go against me who weighs 255 right mm -hmm. grip isn't really entirely based on body weight it's actually got a lot more to do with your hand size but the easiest way to break people up is through body weight so you won't necessarily be competing against me if your body weight is only 110 pounds you'll be in a weight class with you and other people that are that body weight and then i'll be going against people that are my body weight so that way you end up with a scoring based on your your own division wow so what got you into grip training because like you said you did the olympic weightlifting you did the strongman uh powerlifting and stuff of that nature did yeah. you do it to kind of because it was your passion or to stand out like to do something that like not many people have done before because i, I can't name that many people in grip sport you know yeah, I actually got that even um, Veritashvili like right up on my wall, but yeah. um, it's a lot. But it's not; it's pretty underrated for the most part, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. Did you did you start it because it's really like your passion, or and you want to stand out, or what was like the main reason behind like specializing in uh, all this grip work? Yeah. Grip so I, I I I got in it strictly to support my strongman stuff, but once I once I got going and tried a few things, I realized I was actually pretty good. So there's, there's one implement called the blob, which is one half of a 100-pound York dumbbell. So the old-style York dumbbells kind of had a shape to them that was, that was more like a, almost like a giant aspirin pill or Advil pill. So it had a shape like this. And when you grab it, your hand is positioned in a way that you're not just grabbing something that's real narrow and easy to hold on to. You're, 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 you're actually grabbing it on a slope. So it's, it's very challenging to lift. And in 2003, not a lot of people had lifted the blob. Well, the first time I encountered the blob, I actually not only picked it up, but I walked with it. I did like a farmer's carry with it. So wow, wow. It, it's pretty, it was pretty apparent from the beginning that I had some skills 
my hands are really big. I like measuring from the crease of the wrist all the way to the tip of my finger. My right hand's eight and a half inches, and then my left hand's even bigger. It's like almost eight and three quarters inches. That's a really big hand. Like the mm-hmm. average hand size is like seven point five to seven and three quarters. So I've got like an inch longer hand than most people. Plus, my thumb is just ridiculous. I've got, they they call it a porn thumb. It's like way longer than most people's thumbs. And I can really open my hand up almost to 180 degree position from from my thumb to my pinky. And not everybody can do that either. So I've got a really good hand for for grip sport stuff. And I just found that, um, you know, as I got more and more challenges put out before me, you know, I would just start knocking them down and it just it just got cool it, it became cool to take on more challenges so that's why i've always stuck with with grip training and i think if i had to credit someone with it i would say it would be richard soren because he's the guy that invented the the challenge of the york blob and you know back back when i first started every so often richard would put out a a new video he's the guy that owns sorenex exercise company by the way he started it, and uh, now I think it's either a partnership or maybe his son, Bert, owns it now. I'm not really sure, but it's called Sorenex. And uh, when I when I was just starting, uh, every once in a while, he would come out with a new video. So I remember that, like there was a, a time where he was at, uh, adding weight to the blob, making it even harder and lifting it. I couldn't do that. And he's like, at the time... You know, he was in his 60s. I'm not sure how old he is now. So that was very motivating to me to someone to see someone that was in their 60s doing these excellent feats of strength. So then I wanted to try to lift the blob with that weight added. Then he was cleaning the blob, cleaning it to his shoulder. I remember him carrying it. I remember, I think he even snatched it at one point. And, um, you know, just, just seeing someone, for, you know, just first off, someone like basically creating a new challenge just because they wanted something to challenge themselves. I thought that was pretty cool. And then to take that challenge even further, that was very motivating to me. So, you know, throw on top that um, with the, with gripboard.com, there's like an online community there that uh, is always trying to push one another, one up each other. And, you know, people were posting videos back then. Remember, this is before YouTube back in 2003. So it was rare to see videos online. Not everybody was posting videos. Dieselcrew.com was one of the first websites on the Internet to have videos that you could download. We were putting videos up for people to download because YouTube did not exist. And we were constantly overwhelming our bandwidth. So we had to keep upgrading our website all the time because our website kept getting shut down. So it was just a pretty cool time. There was a lot of good stuff going on and the, and the community was new and, you know, people weren't doing a lot of crazy feats because there just wasn't much information out there. So eventually I started writing eBooks and putting out DVDs on how to do this stuff to help people um, along those lines and help them get better. Mm-hmm. So to everybody who doesn't know, uh, would you mind explaining what Diesel Crew is, like how it yeah. came about? Yeah. So in, uh, I used to have a, a business partner in Diesel Crew named Jim Smith. They call him Smitty. Smitty, yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have, have seen him online. Uh, it's like Smitty Diesel, stuff like that. So he runs Diesel Strength Conditioning now. But we started out together in... I believe it was 2003 when we first put put the website up and um, he just liked the term diesel and well in in high and when I was in high school there was a there was a group of guys that would go up on the hill in their in their hunting cabin and, and drink all the time drink beer on the weekends and they were called the cabin crew so I suggested well why don't we do diesel crew and we had we had like two or three other dudes that would come and lift with us on a regular basis uh, during that strongman training period. So we we were all the diesel crew. That's that's what it was about. And, and as far as like a business sense, diesel crew was Jim Smith and Jed Johnson. And then he wanted to start his own website, I think in 2010. So he created that. And then I just stuck with dieselcrew.com. So, so that's what it's all about. So, you know, even my shirt, 
has diesel on it. I don't know if anybody can read that, but no, for sure. sure. Um, the badass. You know, it's a well thought out name too. Like nice. Uh... I, it seems like a thought out name. It was like in a five minute conversation. <laughs> yeah. there, there was no no real thinking or planning um, about it. So, uh, but lots of good times training with those guys. And we used to travel all over the place. We went down to Maryland. We would go up to, I'm in Pennsylvania. So go to Maryland, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Reading, Pennsylvania. We'd go out to Ohio. We went to the Arnold Classic way back in 2004. I mean, we went everywhere to get, like, more knowledge, to train with people who knew what they were doing. We went to Westside. Um, not Westside, I'm sorry. I was never at Westside. We went to uh, the Elite FTS warehouse uh trained all over the place man like we put in so much time on the road just just going and training with people and figuring out you know how to do things learning from people that were better than us all that stuff we, we put a lot of time in just trying to become as good as we possibly could at the types of training that we were doing not for sure and you guys are like uh you guys stood the test of time you know you guys have been around for so long. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, yeah. We've been around forever, and a lot of people really have no idea who I am unless they're involved in grip. But, you know, I, I, I don't see it as pigeonholing. It's just this is what I enjoy, this is what I really love, and this is what I do. And, um, you know, I, I do meet people that have, uh, like yourself, who have been following for years and years and years every so often. And uh, But, you know, for the most part – you know, I'm still like someone that people doesn't know because despite all of my best efforts, you know, a lot of people still don't know what exactly grip sport is. So um, I invite anybody to check out the YouTube channel that I have because I've answered hundreds of questions on there, done all kinds of tutorials. And uh, I think there's a lot of information there that can help people, you know, to steer them in the right direction with, with grip training. And grip, it, it's not only about doing feats of strength. If you bring up your hand strength, all of your other lifts are going to go up. You're going to see better results in your power lifting, your strongman, your weightlifting, highland games, uh, right. arm wrestling, uh, even your even your bodybuilding style training. If you can increase your sets, uh, your heavy sets from doing six to ten repetitions with the same weight, I don't care. Your muscles are going to grow from that. So that was one of the first things I noticed, man. When I started, just started training my grip and not knowing anything about what I was doing, you know, I saw increases in my squat, my my bench, um, my rows, everything was going up. Curls, I, I got up to 90 pound curls way back in like 2002, 2003, whenever it was back, just by just by doing basic grip training. So right, right. There, there's a tremendous amount of benefit that you'll get out of out of working your grip yeah uh i always say like with the fitness world what i'm noticing is that everything it goes full circle you know some things just kind of fall off and uh people are very attracted to to new what's hot right now yeah and uh, a good example of this would be um like neck training for example like mike the machine you know those old videos is talking about neck training he still talks about it till this day but after a while it kind of fell off it's kind of like a lost art um, my buddy Alex and I, we kind of, I don't want to say re revived it, but we, we started like talking about it, kind of died off for a bit. Uh, you see guys like uh, Kino Body now, he's he's promoting it. So it's kind of like, it's just something I'm noticing in the fitness world. You see certain things like people always want what's new, you know, what's like yeah. fresh, fresh ideas. But like these are all, yes. there's nothing new under the sun, just recycled stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's uh... or just wording it in different ways and just expressing it yeah. differently. Yeah, something uh, on a related note to that, uh, you know, there's the hashtags on like Instagram, for instance. I follow uh, the hashtag grip training and grip strength and inch dumbbell, stuff like that. And stuff, <clears throat> it's kind of annoying. Stuff comes up on the timeline or the feed or whatever, and it says like inch dumbbell and the dude will be skiing. Mm -hmm. Or grip training, and it's, it's just a dude like standing there with his kids. So it's like, it's like people are jumping on the bandwagon for the hashtag and just applying it to like all of their pictures. And it's like, I don't, 
I mean, your kids look great. Don't get me wrong, but I don't, I want to see pictures of people trying to lift the inch dumbbell, not hanging out with their kids. So I don't know. It's one of those. Well, weird why would things. they? Why would they? T- why would they put a hashtag on that if? I have no idea. The only thing that I could think of is like they have like a list of their hashtags that they want to rank for, and they must have them in like a notepad document or something on their phone. And then they just uh, like highlight them, hit copy, and then paste it at the bottom of the post that they put up, and then it's there. But I, I have no idea, man. I really don't. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so speaking of the grip strength, right? So, what's your proudest feat of strength, and what's some what's some strength, um, yeah, some weaknesses that you see in your own strength, like stuff you need to bring up? Yeah, um, I would say. I think my answer to this changes sometimes based on what I'm, what I'm working on, but probably the thing I'm most proud of is becoming the first person to ever lift two old pinch. school York 45 pound plates in each hand in a pinch grip. So there's this very, very rare type of plate called the old school York and it's a deep dish plate. So if you look at a lot of the, plates that you see today they're only about an inch maybe an inch and a quarter uh, in in thickness well the the old school yorks from like the 50s 60s 70s they're actually really really thick and they're they're called deep dish plates and when you put two of them together each one is two inches you put two of them together they're four inches in size so a four inch grip is something like that jesus christ so if, if you try plate pinching, whoever, everybody listening, if you try plate pinching, go put two 45-pound plates together and try to pinch them. So with the smooth sides facing out so that you can't, like, reach into a hole or something like that, I'm just about guaranteeing you're not going to be able to do that. It's, it's two 45s is something that took me well over a year. To finally, to finally, okay, just regular 245s. I got a set of old school Yorks in 2004. I was not able to pinch grip those with the smooth sides out until 2013. So it took me nine years just to do one set. Of how long? How long was the hold? How long was the hold? It wasn't. I mean, it was a fraction of, it was a second at most. Just got it up, yeah. Yeah, because so, to complete to complete most feats, you have to stand up with it in a lockout position. So, and then, then you're done. You can just, like, throw the plates to the side if you want to. Some, with some feet lists, you have to return it to the ground under control, but not, not always. But the main thing is you got to pick it up to lockout. You can't just break it off the ground. That's, that's no good. You got to stand up to lockout. Um, Does the elbow have to be locked out too? The elbow? Yeah. No, no. You can do whatever you want to with the elbow. You can so you elbow. just—it's just the knees have to be locked out. So you're standing straight, and that's it. Yeah, your knees, knees, hips, and shoulder has to be back. Generally, it's the if you're lifting with this arm, and a lot of times it's almost impossible to pull this shoulder back. So it's the other shoulder that's looked at for for lockout, the offhand shoulder. Um. So it took me nine years to lift one set, and then it took me four more years to lift a set in each hand. So the the other thing that the other thing that makes this tough is with the old school Yorks. If you look at the rim around like new plates, usually the rim is like an inch, two inches, something like that. So they they don't if they slide, they don't collapse inside one another. But with the old school Yorks, you're only looking at like maybe three eighths of an inch of a rim around the outside. And it's, it it doesn't come to a point, but it's like rounded. So Mm -hmm. if the plates shift at all, they end up going like this. They fall inside of one another and it ruins the lift. So not only are you contending with a four inch grip that requires extreme thumb strength in the pinching, but also, if they move at all, those plates will, like, collapse on you. So it's, it's extraordinarily hard just to, just to lift one set. I think there might only be, like, ten people that have ever done one set. That's, that's how hard they are. 
you really, if you have tiny hands, you're not going to be able to do this feat. It's just not going to happen. You really have to have large, large hands. Um, and then in uh, March, it, actually, my 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 two year anniversary of, of doing this was this past week. It just started popping up on my timeline on Facebook. Um, I think it was the 27th, so it might have been last uh, two weeks ago. But uh, yeah, it took it took me. It took me basically 13 years to be able to do that feat. Um, it was it's fucking crazy, so, man. Yeah, and you know, and it's not like for 13 years I trained it every time I went into the gym. That's that's not the case. But you know, I would do like between two and six week training blocks where I was extremely heavily focused on old school York pinching, and it, I mean, you you just can't train the same thing all the time. A, it gets boring. B, it gets frustrating. But C, you can kind of burn yourself out because you're, like, doing the same stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And plus, I do competitions, like, three or four times a year. There's been years that I've done, like, six competitions in one year. So something that's very demanding, like old school York pinches, uh, you can't you can't really do those when you're doing a competition. Because if the competition's got five events in it, you got to put time in on each of those events throughout your training week. So you might not have time for some extra feet of strength work. So, you know, six months, eight months might go by in between two training sessions for the old school York. So the, all of those factors put together is why it took nine years to do one set and four more right, years right. to do the second set. It's, I, I still can't get over it, man. That's why I had to post it on my, on my story, you know, because I had a guy on my wall. <clears throat> I got like all these posters all over the place, and I, I think I had at one point in my old room uh, of a guy who did two forty fives. It's like a black and white photo. I think the guy was like in the seventies, like all wearing some overalls and just like gripping. I'm like, well, this is not even human, you know. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I see uh, the Natty Limit page on Instagram. He posted it, and I'm like, wow, this is like, like you literally have to be like a <laughs> fucking gorilla to do this, you know. But uh, so so on the same topic of that, how did you train? Because this is like the money question. People want to know how did you train to get that? Did you do a, like for example reefs deadlifts? Like what did you, for example, did you train it a couple times a week? Did you have days where it's like, what what's the programming like to get that for those who are curious to get like a stronger pinch grip? For for the what what I can I can tell you what really worked for me. Like I began seeing progress once I. Once, uh, once I went from doing it all the time when I went to the gym to doing it just one day a week. So I would, I would place it on a day of the week where I wasn't doing a bunch of other pinch grip training. That way my thumb was fresher. So one day a week became the, the best thing for me. And then what, uh, what I've, I don't want I don't want to make it sound like I invented this cause I didn't, but I've developed a few different ways to do what's called deloading deloading so you would take the actual implement or implements that you're training on and then you would make it lighter through various means so you can use um i've used uh a trampoline a mini trampoline before i've used um cushions and foam underneath okay, the, all right. yeah underneath the implements i've used bands to deload things I used, I used to have a platform that I used a lot made out of just a piece of wood, some eye bolts on the wood, and then bands attached to each eye bolt, and then the bands are attached up above, maybe on a barbell in a cage or something like that. Um, and I found that that's, that's the absolute best way to, to train for, for feats of strength. Um, it's it, interesting. It's, so it's kind of like the pinching. reverse band, but you just keep uh, making the band tension uh, lower to or like the yeah. when you're doing the the teaching someone to pull up and they're using like the band assisted and you just keep yeah. narrowing the bands till that's it's the same exact concept exactly exactly so you had it on what like a mini trampoline and then you just put on like a like a cushion and then just kept uh um i didn't i don't i don't think i used the mini trampoline for the old school yorks i would use the mini trampoline for inch dumbbell work so I would kind of, uh, are you familiar with the inch dumbbell? Yeah. 
Okay, so if people aren't familiar with the inch dumbbell, they look like the dumbbells that are above your head and then slightly off to the side on the rack. They're the globe head dumbbells. Only with the inch dumbbell, it's named after Thomas Inch, and it has a 2 and 3 eighths inch handle, so it's very, very thick. So it's not a 1 inch dumbbell. It's the Thomas Inch dumbbell. It's 2 and 3 eighths inch. So it's like grabbing a soda can or a beer can that's attached to two giant globe heads. Um, and when you try to lift this thing, because the globes are so much bigger than the handle, the globes start to rotate and it rips out of your hand. So it, it, it will find a way to defeat your hand. I used the, the mini trampoline as a way to, I would push down on the inch dumbbell, I would get a stretch in the trampoline, it would cave in and then it would propel the dumbbell up. So then I could get like a momentum or a boost coming out of the bottom position on the on the trampoline. There were several times where I picked it up, it ripped out of my hand and then bounced errantly off the trampoline and smashed my calf, smashed my ankle or my heel. I mean, lots of fun there. I'm I'm sure you can understand. It, yeah. Real pain. Um, but the main one, the main one that I did for the old school Yorks was uh, the band attachments, the the the, the reverse band. So you would loop, you would loop it in the hole. Um, in the hole yeah, that's then... when I use. That's when I would use the wood platform with the eye bolts and then the bands attached up above. Okay. And just just tiny bands like uh, the red jump stretch bands or the black jump stretch bands. Um, those were the ones that I used. They were the the miniature ones, very very small ones. If you if you give yourself too much assistance, it, it's futile. You don't you don't want too much assistance. You want just enough. So. You have to be able to play with the band that you're using and the height that it's rigged at, stuff like that, you, to get the right tension. On a quick note, do you think like uh, I'm not personally training for this, but like for someone who is for training for the two hand uh, pinch, like something like a Reeves deadlift, you think that'd be yeah. good? Um, a Reeves it's deadlift. It's not specific enough, be, huh? Because it's too a wide. A Reeves deadlift. The way that a Reeves deadlift generally works is they. Um, they will use the inside plate. Right, right, rims right. Pointed out. Yeah. So you're going to be able to hook your fingers inside of the rims, whether it's sure. an old school York pinch or, uh, excuse me, old school York plate that has a really big rim on it. Or uh, I shouldn't say big, more like a deep rim. Or even one of the, you know, more regular uh, modern style 45s. Generally, if you... Uh, if you set it up right, you can hook your fingers in there, and it's not really a pinch grip at all. No, that's actually not a good question because um, the the hands are too wide. It's not specific enough, but also like um, your hands have to work on keeping the the plates together. And if you put yeah. on a bar, you, I know, yeah, I you can use a bar. You can use a bar or a or like a plastic pipe or a loading pin in order to keep the plates from shifting on you. So. I think that that's I'm sure I did that at some point. I think I used um, a PVC pipe in order to just lift them up, pinch them as one unit without having to worry about the slippage. So that I mean, that worked out. That's I mean, that's something that I did also. But I just think by far I got the most benefit out of the deloading process. Right. Right. So moving away from the, the performance aspect for a sec, I got a lot of people on my channel who want to even myself and want to build some bigger forms, which yeah. you obviously have. So if you were to just narrow it down to like three lifts that have contributed the most to your to forearm mass, yeah, you know, it's really for the um, bodybuilders. So like my my flexor mass is pathetic. I think um, I don't think I have good genetics for for forearm mass in the flexors. I think I have decent genetics for the for the back of the forearm. Um, but I've worked with a lot of people on their forearms, and I can say that, uh, um, first of all, if you want to build forearms, then do forearm exercises. You will get bigger forearms from grip training, but not nearly as much gain as you would by just doing forearm exercises. So for the flexors, I would suggest behind-the-back wrist, cur uh, yeah, behind wrist curls. You could use a normal barbell. But I think you'll you'd really like it with a thick bar, some kind of an axle or a pipe axle that you make by yourself, or even putting fat grips on a barbell. Um, I think you'll you'll find really good results there for the flexors. 
for the back of the forearm, my favorite is reverse curls. This is a some this is an exercise that I did for years straight every single week um, to prevent the onset of tennis elbow in the back of the in the back of the forearm. So this kind of movement, pronated right. grip, palm down. I like the the easy curl bar with the the different angles in it. And then that gets me out of straight right. pronation. Um, you do a fat, think, fat handle or with the fat, fat easy bar or like an axle bar? Or just... um, so I just use the, a regular easy curl bar. That's, that's okay. all I would use. Um, it's, you know, that's, that comes down to personal preference, but I've, I've just had plenty of good results from using just the basic easy curl bar. Um, dude, I mean, that's, those are the main ones. Those are the main ones. Right. Uh, maybe for for another one, maybe like a farmer's hold, something really really heavy. Farmer's hold with an actual farmer's implement might be something to throw in there. That way you're getting the mass type of uh, development as well as some strength to go along with it. So mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. Those are the main two. You got the flexors. You got the back of the forearm. Maybe a rotational like uh, some kind of lever with a or a, a rotation lever with a, a sledgehammer or, or something like that might be good. But other than that, the, the behind the back and the reverse curls are a couple of the best things you can do, I think. And what are your, what are your strength standards for those? Um, uh, like what, like two plates for like 20 or something when you do wrist curl and then like... Uh... Oh, two plates? I was going to say 185. I, I figured I could probably do 185 for 20. Maybe. I've never done that lift, so I don't know. Yeah. Like, uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the reason I like that lift is because you can handle a great amount of weight on it with a normal barbell. Right. Um, with a with an axle, it's going to make things a lot harder. So when I have my wrestlers do that, they generally use uh, uh, an axle. Okay. So um, that makes it harder for them. Uh, and as far as I, I don't ever drop below quarters added to the easy curl bar. So my easy curl weighs like 13 to 15 pounds, depending on which one I use. So I'm looking at like 63 to 65 pounds for the overhand grip reverse reverse curl. And then okay. I'm doing, you know, 10 to 15 reps, depending on where uh, how everything feels that day. So, you know, you just, just uh, adjust from there. Uh, according to your strength levels. Okay. I'm a I was asking uh, about the strength standards because I myself, I always hated doing curls. And I always found them so boring. Mm -hmm. And then um, just like you, it's just like I don't like just doing pump work just for the sake of doing pump work, you know. Yeah. It's nice to do, but it's nice to set goals too. <clears throat> and I just had a Q&A with Devin Knox. He's like a strict curl competitor, big arms, whatever. And I really like this. I like I like training arms now with the with the strict curl because mm -hmm. it gives more of like a it just funner, you know. It's more justifiable with the numbers, and you're able to like track progress a bit easier. Yeah. And yeah. with a freestanding curl, it's it's really easy to cheat, you know. But when you put yourself against a wall, and I stumbled across a video of you doing the strict curl. I think you did like 158 or so. I forgot the number, but so what's yeah, your experience training with that? Yeah. I'm sorry. What's what your was experience? That last part? Yeah, yeah, what's your experience training with that lift, the strict curl? I'll, I'll tell you, it's funny. Um, I, I had, I guess, prior to that video, I think that video was like 2014, 2015. Prior to that, I hadn't ever done the strict curl standing against the wall. I think maybe I had seen it here and there um, discussed on old forums, but I hadn't really done it. And then there was a, this website called gripmonsters.com put out a challenge like a competition for five to eight different lifts. And they weren't all grip training. Um, one of them was, I think it was 50 kilos total on the bar with your back against the wall for as many reps as possible. And that was the first time that I tried it. Now, I've always loved arm training. Um, one of my main goals, and I started talking about this, and then we start, we got off into a different direction. Is one of my main, like one of my lifetime goals, is to to develop twenty inch arms cold. 
Like they're at just a, a shade under 19 generally. Um, and then they swell up to over 20 once I get a pump on, but I want 20 inches cold. That would be, that would be pretty cool to me. Um, and I actually think people can benefit from, from bicep training because, you know, like strong men and power lifters tear their biceps, not all the time, but, you know, rather frequently. And you right, find out right. that they do all the events and they do rows and, and, stuff like that, but they don't do any curls. So I think it has, there's something to be said about working the, the bicep through its full range of motion with supination and all that stuff. But um, right. my experience with that, with that lift against the wall was, was mainly just for the grip monsters challenge that was going on. I don't, I want to say it was like February of 2015. So, so it, it was cool. They were doing that and uh, dips plus weight for as much weight as possible. I think I came in second on that one. I came in second or third on the curl. There was also um, what they called military bench press. So you would lay on the bench and do your body weight on the bench, on the barbell with your feet up. You weren't allowed to use your feet. So, uh, so that was pretty cool. I don't think I finished quite as well on that one. You know, there were a bunch of challenges. It was, it was a fun, fun time. There was a lot of stuff to, to do. And, you know, there were about 20 people around the world trying all these things. So it was pretty cool. Right. So speaking of muscle, um, not muscle imbalances, but you know people tearing their biceps and stuff of that nature. Yeah. Um, let's talk about like the conventional deadlift, and people wanting to get a stronger double overhand grip. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of different um, schools of thought for this. You know, some people they say just do uh, you know just add fat grips on, um, on the bar, and then it's like the rolling thunder. Some people say just use an axle bar. Other people say uh, screw both of those, just use the regular bar and just, you know, you could do thumbless grip or just wrap around to be more specific. Yeah. But in your opinion, from all the grip training you've been doing all these years, what's the fastest way to get a strong double overhand grip deadlift? So I would absolutely go in the group of just focus on double overhand deadlift um, with variations, um, like taking your thumb off or... uh, maybe doing something like three finger holds, doing holds for time, overloads in a cage, um, band resisted work, things along those lines. Thick bar, it, the, the way your hands work, your, your, your hand is very joint specific. So the strength that you develop is joint specific. So if you need strength here, you need to train in this range. If you go and train thick bar, especially like rolling thunder where your hands open like that, you're training everything in a completely different position. So the carryover from rolling thunder to um, double overhand deadlift is often very disappointing for people. So Mm -hmm. it's a shame because there's a lot of marketing out there that says, you know, get a thick bar, get a fat, get a set of fat grips, etc., and then you'll automatically get stronger. Well, you will get stronger, but may you may not get stronger in the way that you want to. So it just goes back to specificity. And um, I think sometimes people see thick bar, they see that it's harder to lift on, on thick handle dumbbells or fat grips and things like that. Well, if I can bring my hand strength up using these fat grips, then I'll go back to my deadlift and my deadlift grip will go up. And I, I've lost count of the number of people that did like six, eight weeks training on, on thick bar stuff and didn't see right. any improvement at all on, on their deadlift. So. It's, it's really a matter of time of getting your, or excuse me, it's really just a matter of getting your hands used to handling more weight using different means. Even uh, farmers, farmers implements, you know, if people are going to train farmers, you should get farmers implements. You should not carry dumbbells around. You should carry around farmers implements if you can afford them because you can load your hands with so much more weight and it's weight that will be testing your back your upper back, your, your traps, your, your right. shoulders, you know, with a, with a hundred pound dumbbells, you might not be able to carry them very far, but at the same time, you're not testing the rest of your body with farmers. You're, you're testing your hands with way more weight. The, the way that everything is mechanically set up, you can handle more weight in your hands and then you're, you're, you're making the whole rest of your body stronger. So I suggest people get farmers, but, uh, I got off track there a little bit. But no, yeah, I'm sure no. with the deadlift. But yeah. like, um, it's funny because I was going to ask you about the grip myths later on. 
we kind of just got done now and uh just like what you just said i guess there's a lot of misconceptions out there and people are marketing like i don't know x product like it's gonna it will give them a stronger grip but maybe the not the exact kind of grip strength they're looking for yeah because of the specificity aspect right so okay so i guess yeah, well the other one is the name of the game the other one that drives me insane is people that buy grippers in order to bring their deadlift up this this right. range of motion here doing this over and over with grippers is not going to do much of anything for your deadlift grip unless you just started training like right if your hands are are super super weak then yeah grippers will probably help you um with your deadlift grip they'll they'll help you get your hands used to doing work but if you're if you're an experienced individual grippers are not going to do much for you when it comes to your deadlift grip um you're, you you'll get better at grippers but it's not going to carry over to a lot of other lifts so you you are better at you you are better off doing stuff like thick bar work and like more like strongman style training of grip um maybe even bringing up your thumb strength a little bit than than focusing on grippers i, I, I just i just think that's another one that's a little bit um misleading like when you when you when you train with grippers you just don't get that adaptation with with improved hand strength at least with thick bar training your hands are going to get stronger period may not right. still may not help with your specific goal you like you might not be able to do more pull-ups because you started training rolling thunder um but at least you're going to get stronger hands and like with grippers it's just, you just don't get a lot out of grippers grippers are great for grippers that's about it okay, okay. so let's just take a scenario because um I'm dealing with all kinds of different clients right now. You know, I got old women, I got people my age, got people younger, yeah. very broad yeah. spectrum. Obviously, just focus on the basics. But uh, let's take my client, one of my clients, for example, who, uh, when it comes to deadlift, doesn't he has very he's like the opposite of you. He has extremely small hands. Yeah. So, but he's still a novice. So I don't want to. Obviously, I'm not going to give him straps right now. And uh, I've noticed that when he does the double over. There tends to be a, like a little bit of a twist that I'm not really like, we'll still do the double over, but we want to, I want to get him as strong as possible with the double over hand first, you know, mm -hmm. but we still do the double over because it's not too excessive of a twist. So it's still, I still want to overload his body. Um, you recommend what I'm doing is I'm just, we're doing as many warm sets as possible with the double over hand. You know, we chalk up and then we, and then right after we'll just go to double over the, the mix grip. Yep. But what would you recommend? Like, I don't care if there's a better way I'm going to do it. Would you recommend, for example, I give him some extra grip work on off days? Like, what's a good, what's a good fix to that? Um, so, and is, and, and is, with that advice alone, by the way, um, his, it's, it's very funny because his double overhand strength is actually very close to his mixed grip strength for, for some strange reason. So it is working, but I just want to know if that's the way you'd recommend. So... Um, you're, you're deadlifting on a straight bar, correct? Bar the client, bar. But yeah. Client, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah the, the lifter is. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and what's the end goal? What's the end goal out of deadlifting? Is is he going to be a power lifter and compete? No, no, or? no, no. Just general strength, general size. All right. So, like, I'm so afraid of, de of uh, bicep curls. Or, I'm sorry, bicep tears. I'm so afraid of bicep tears that I don't have any of my lifters do an alternated grip whatsoever. So I would just work them double overhand, and I would actually have them use straps, believe it or not. On you would, deadlift. okay. I, I, I don't care about that. Like, like, <laughs> like, really, the deadlift is not building grip strength. Like, like, the objective of the deadlift is not to build and test your grip strength. The objective of the deadlift is to strengthen the rest of your body. So <clears throat> I would train them double overhand until he can't do that anymore and then i would have him put straps on and do the rest of his deadlifts that way and then what i would say is don't use straps on the other stuff so like dumbbell rows um no barbell you know, rows. yeah barbell rows lat pull down stuff like that try to keep him away from straps on those and then because i there's probably not as big of a difference that you'll see between strapped work and non-strapped work on those isolation move or more isolation moment movements than on the deadlift. Um, and 
you're not if if you don't if you don't strap up on the deadlift and stay double overhand, then you're gonna you know run the risk of not developing throughout like your posterior chain and stuff. Overloading like that. your body, yeah. Yeah. So like literally on just on yesterday, uh, on Friday, as we record this, it's a Saturday. So yesterday was Friday, and I trained my guy Jeff, and I had him do Romanian deadlifts because on a different day he does trap bar deadlifts. So right. Um, but uh, you know his, his grip was his dying on the Romanians, were, right? Were kind of stumpy. What's sorry? His his uh, his grip was dying on the Romanians, right? Yes, yes. Right. Because he's got kind of stumpy hands. And it's like he doesn't have weak hands, but he's they're, they're shorter fingers and they're thicker. So when he wraps around, it's like it's like it's almost like he's gripping a thick bar because his fingers are thicker. Um, so I'm like, dude, you don't have to let's let's get these straps out, man, because I'm trying to train his his glutes, his hammies, his lower back. I don't care about his hands. When we do grip, he wants to lift the blob. We're going to we're going to train grip at a different time. So I see nothing wrong with using straps, especially, especially on movements like deadlifts, RDLs, um, heavy shrugs, stuff where you're going to be moving some weight, maybe even some cheat shrugs, you know, strapping up on those. Like, even if they're novices, right? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. The, it'll come. The grip strength going to come as long as is. See, here's the deal, man. When I first started lifting regularly, I had my belt, I had wrist straps on my belt and I had straps on my belt. And the first thing I did was I would take all those off my belt, wrap the belt on, tighten that thing up. And then I would right. put the wrist straps. I would put the, um, the wrist wraps and then I would put the straps on my hands and I was walking around, uh, with, with all this apparel on me right from the beginning. So I kind of like set myself back, I think in my development, because I would immediately strap up on everything. Like, curls right pull downs so as long as he's not doing that i think he's going to be fine then like you said you're already doing like accessory grip work for him so right. i don't i don't see any reason why he can't strap up on on the barbell it's just the last thing you want to do is tear that dude's bicep this is like you know dad jed uh guiding the young trainer right um, right you know what I mean? Like the last thing you want to do is hurt your client because then he's going to be pissed off. He might not come to you anymore and you'll lose him as a client and that, you know, that financial end. So I look at it that way, man. I try to eliminate injuries with my, with my guys and keep risks to a minimum. And I, I'll never, I, yeah, I can yeah. pretty much say never do alternated grip with my, with my clients. Cause I yeah. don't know what injuries they're dealing with. I don't know what tightnesses they're dealing with. Especially if it's an even just a middle aged guy, like someone my age that's forty. You don't know what they're dealing with. How long are they sitting there at that desk all the time in a pronated position? Their their right. bicep tendon might right. be shortened, you know what I mean? You you just don't know. It might be tight and then you can end up compromising that and I would just mm-hmm. I would feel bad, you know. So Yeah, and I feel like that's a, that's an aspect of fitness that's not really talked about that much, like different imbalances, you know, and yeah. a lot of people are starting to talk about it a little bit more now. Yeah, but like you know, all the, like the front squats, like these kind of grips, and just uh, all these things that we may not think like cause imbalances that could. Yeah. So, well, luckily for the client, like um, you know, no injuries. He's a young guy. You know, he's in his twenties. So am I. <laughs> um, and but like the, the the double overhand grip stuff that I have been recommending to him, it's going very well. But like I, I guess I am gonna take your word for that. He didn't. He doesn't know what the straps are. You know, I yeah. just never, I didn't even think it was worth mentioning it to him because when I first started with him, you know, he was like at, like deadlifting, I think one plate and now he's like at two and a half. So it's just like, yeah. I didn't think it was just, but the funny thing is I wasn't actually expecting that kind of answer from you. And mm-hmm. I guess it's because there's so many power lifters online on Instagram and like on YouTube. And let's be real, like what you just said, like client didn't even know what powerlifting was you know what i mean yeah and so people were actually quite funky don't even care what powerlifting is and they're literally just coming to me like a uh, recreational lifter you know they want to look they yeah. want to look better they want to get stronger overall and um sure they want to get big good at the big three but it's not like they don't know about they didn't know what it was you know yeah but like in that respect in that regard like yeah for sure like uh, i guess that is a good option as long as they're not, they're not wrapping it too many times just wrap it once 
you know, so well, still um, a little. Along along those lines, like by far my my preferred method of grip aid is Versa grips rather than straps because it takes like 18 seconds to wrap straps up with Versa grips. You're in position in like eight seconds. Right. Are you familiar with Versa grips? I'll search up after. Uh, I've heard about it, but not like. Um... They're they're really nice. I don't know what they cost these days. I think the price has gone up. Like I I had my set. When I first started lifting with Smitty, it was either 98 or 99. I can't remember. I bought them back in 98 or 99. And when I moved from my my garage gym down to my actual gym building in town, we, we misplaced the Versa grips. I don't know where they are. <laughs> I'm like mm-hmm. separation anxiety up in this piece because I don't know where my Versa grips are. I haven't done anything that I needed to use grips on since then, so I'm not missing out. But I really rather have my Versa grips back, okay. um, and they were they were awesome, dude. They're they're just they're just awesome. Um, nice. It, it's just it's like, you know, you wrap them opposite, just like just like straps. They go this way. You put your fingers over them, and it takes like three seconds to put them on. You know, you put them on with like a strap that you tighten. Actually, now they have Velcro, so you put it on there and then you Velcro it. Mine had uh, had like the buckle strap that you pull through. And then it's tight as shit. And then um, when you're done, you have broken blood vessels all over your wrist. And people are wondering, like, what the heck you got into over the weekend? Where were the handcuffs? Who was it? Stuff like that. What did you, right. you know, was it was drinking involved? Stuff like that. But it looks it looks really cool on your wrist um, to have those marks. Those are all jokes right there. I mean, I'm just, they do break yeah. blood vessels. Yeah. You know, it's not cool to get in fights drinking and get arrested. So of course. Yeah, disclaimer, disclaimer afterwards. <laughs> Not a worry. But uh, so let's talk about grip imbalances, right? Let's take, for example, uh, let's take the example of someone who's deadlifting double overhand grip. And let's say the left hand just keeps uh, just keeps dropping. Mm-hmm. What would you do for someone like that? Um, what exercise I would, look at would their you technique. recommend? Technique, I would look huh? at their technique first off to see if they're they're putting their hand on there wrong or if they're uh you know i've seen some people with problems with their shoulder where like they'll line up even even me to a degree sometimes my left shoulder lags forward so i'm i kind of sit like this at times i don't know if you can tell my left shoulder is lower so i have i have to like actively pull my shoulder blade back due to some problems that i've had over the years with uh thoracic outlet syndrome and some imbalances and uh damage that i've had with my pec so I would look at that because sometimes uh, just biomechanically and kinetically, like the way that you're lined up can cause problems with, with your grip. So that would be the first thing that I looked at. After that, then you got to look at like, does the person have some kind of a, a lingering issue with that arm even? Um, like I said, with thoracic outlet syndrome, it's coming out of your neck and the communication of the of the nerves is actually damaged into your arm so you can't execute the same kind of strength you can't you can't produce the same kind of strength in your arm due to that condition and there's right. there's right. several conditions that can contribute to that as well so you, you may have to correct that um and then you know are are they are they naturally right-handed and their left hand is just weaker um, do they have a manual labor job where it's actually set up for right-handed and, um, they don't have an opportunity to strengthen their left hand, but they're pulling on a, on a hand trigger all day long. There's so many variables that can contribute to that, that it's hard to narrow it down. But, um, if, if you can, if you can take all those crazy variables out and then you then figure out that they're just weaker, then they might have to do some extra holds with the left hand or try some extra reps or, or, uh, on their rows or, or something like that. There's there's going to be a way to address right. it. There surely right. is. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's kind of the answer I was expecting. There's a lot, so many different factors when it comes yeah. to like imbalances so and stuff like that. And so many factors, especially after you've, uh, I don't know, how long have you been doing your personal training? I've been doing it uh, six, seven years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm sure you've, you've run into some cases where it's like you got to really ask a lot of questions to figure out the problems. That's the reason that someone has oh, a problem. Sure. The more questions yeah. you ask, the better, you know? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes you just gotta, 
whether you call it investigation or due diligence or whatever, you got to figure out what the heck is going on there. And sometimes it could be like, you know, they sprained their wrist when they were 12 and now they're 22 and they just never, they never corrected that situation. Um, they, they might be arm wrestling in the bar every single weekend and they have tendonitis in their bicep tendon or something like that. It, all that stuff right. can contribute. Then you have to try to work through that. So yeah, there's, right, there's so many factors that come into yeah. play. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your programming, right? <clears throat> so let's say somebody want, wants to specialize in the grip training. Yeah. Give us like a very rough, like not, too, not too detailed. Cause I know we could talk about this for days, but very rough outline of like uh, of what your programming looks like, like on average. For someone that wants to bring up their grip strength for yeah. like grip sport or something like yeah, that. Or grip sport, grip yeah. yeah. So you're going to look at a few factors. How many days a week are they training and what kind of training do they do besides grip strength? Because the things that you do in the weight room could either, they, 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 they can affect what you do in grip. They can affect how well you can do grip both for negative and positive. So <clears throat> for instance, if someone is training strong man and they got to do like a truck deadlift or, or something that's very, very demanding of the hands, then you don't want to have them do grippers after they do that because their grippers are going to be fried. Their hands are going to be worn out and they're not going to have their top end strength for grippers. So you'd want to put those on a different day. So you got to look at what the person's already doing in their training in order to optimize all the programming that you do for them after that. And then it's a matter of, you know, how many days do you have to train for stuff? You got to try to figure out their recovery rates. So, um, you know, most people are not going to be able to train grippers more than like twice a week because they're so demanding. Plus you have with grippers, you have the knurling on the handles, which is something else to contend with, with, with gripper training. Um, it's going to be based on what their goals are, what they want to lift. So if someone wants to train for the old school York pinch, then you can only do that so many times a week uh, for one reason, due to the edges of the plates being so sharp. If you do it too much, you're going to, you're going to end up having a tear on your thumb and then you won't be able to train for a while. So that's going to dictate how often you can train that. And then also how much volume you're actually, you're actually able to do. And you may have to bring in some kind of a protection factor for your thumb in order to keep from having um, a tear. Uh, a, it's going to depend on what uh, what implements they have in their arsenal. So some people have really extensive um, e uh, collections of equipment, and they have a lot of alternatives, a lot of things to choose from. Other people that are just getting started don't have all that. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, so usually for most people, it's going to be either three or four days a week, depending on their schedule. And the, the more demanding stuff is going to take place earlier in the workout. The stuff where it doesn't matter if you're fresh or not, it's just work that needs to be done. Um, recovery work, stretching, all that stuff is going to be at the end. And then you got to just kind of play with some of the variables based on their individual needs analysis and the, the things that they want to work on. Um, I can tell you that the fewer the goals, the better. So like three to five in grip training is like the magic numbers. Um, three to five events that you're training on all at once, three to five movements per workout, three to five uh, reps per, um, per set. That seems to be like the golden rule for most for most grip training. And uh, mm -hmm. those are some of the guidelines that I use, but every, every person is a little bit different. There's going to be tweaks that are made to programs, enhancements, and you know, you're going to, you're going to have to progress and de uh, regress them based on where they're at um, and what they have and, and things along those lines. So from your experience and your, in your opinion, what do you think is the grip, the exercise from in grip sport that's the most taxing on the body? Like if you overdo it, like you, you'd be smart to not overdo. Boy, that's a tremendous question. A lift from grip sport that would be more demanding on your body. I'm thinking probably something like axle deadlift because that's, uh, 
you know, you have the potential to, you're not going to lift as much weight as you would do on a normal bar, but you have the potential to be lifting 300 pounds, um, for, you know, most people, I, I've just reached the level that I've gotten back over 400 pounds for the first time since like 2015. Um, so that compared to my normal deadlift, you know, I could usually deadlift 500 pounds when I, when I try to. So it's only about 80% of my, my normal deadlift. The axle is 80% of my normal deadlift more or less. Um, but if I were doing that more than twice a week, I would easily get zapped. I would be, I would be overtrained in a heart. So, um, I got to move my laptop. I hope this isn't too annoying. But, yeah, go um, away. So I would say that would be the, as far as a pure grip sport type of movement, axle probably would be the one that would be the most demanding and cause uh, the most potential problems. Right. Okay. So we're, we're uh, approaching near the end. Okay. So to everybody who, who stayed tuned for, uh, who stuck around the whole time, you know, you guys are the real MVPs. <laughs> I know I'm enjoying this and learning a lot. So oh. when well, it give comes the, to the... Give the video a like, too, because, uh, you know, this is actually the second time we tried this, and we put a lot of work in, and I got to hand it to you for, you know, being so dedicated to your craft and and wanting to have a good product to put out for your for your followers, so you definitely deserve a like. So give this, give them a like, guys. Yeah, give, give us a, a like, show us some love. That's yeah. right. Yeah, we're working on a bunch of uh, like trying to work these softwares. You know, the quality is just gonna go up from here. Yeah. But uh, so I'm not, I'm not really, really, I'm not gonna say I'm a grip guy because I'm definitely not. But I do respect it, and I do, I do have fun with it sometimes in my training. You know. And right now I have a coach, so I'm kind of just doing what he's telling me to do. But I do have um, some country of crush, country of crush. And, uh, if, you know, I work a lot of security. So when I'm on my break, you know, I'm warming up my food. That's when I'm usually just, <laughs> I'm just like, uh, when I'm waiting for my food in the microwave, I use my country crush. And I made my captain of crush, mm -hmm. COC. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I, got, I got a couple of them. I haven't obviously didn't buy a 350 because like when I got the 300, I'm like, okay, this is really like tough, man, you know? Yeah. But uh, got the 250, but the 300, it's like, I don't even know how you do that. Yeah. Sorry about that. No the problem. The 300 is like, uh, so what's some technique? Because I don't know about the technique. How do you hold it? Well, most people... Most people that I see have the gripper way too far back in their hand. So you, you want to use your thumb to control the gripper and use the thumb pad as a foundation. But you actually want the gripper further ahead in your hand than you may think. In fact, the back angle should be in contact with at least one callus on your callus line. So I'm talking about this line of calluses your gripper should actually be right there so that a part of the gripper is touching them. So what that does is that puts, you, you want to put your hand in a position where you're creating a pocket like this. So the gripper would sit in here. It's going to be on the callus line, and then your thumb is forward, and then when you set, it's going to look like this. Okay. Most people, when they grip, when they have a gripper in their hand, their hand is flat, the, and the gripper is positioned way back here. The, and I'm talking the back handle. The back handle is way back here. Well, the further that you have to move your, your fingers into the back of your hand, the weaker those fingers become, or at least the, the, the less potential they have to create force on the gripper handles. So if you can get the handle moved forward, your fingers won't have to move as far in order to get the two handles to touch. And then if you create this pocket, and it's going to create a situation where the gripper can more comfortably sit in that position. Right, right. That's that's what it's all about. It it it's like gripper success is not about the drills. It's not about the reps. It's not about the the overall volume that you're doing. It's about the technique and where the gripper is. No, definitely. That's one thing I noticed. Like how I grip it in different ways. Um, sometimes I'm able to crush it. Sometimes I'm not. But it's like it's really about how I hold it. You know. 
Yeah. But uh, what's the most you have you ever touched the 350? You ever tried it? So, so the 350, the so you so you're using grippers that are measured in like the 150 increments, right? So right, right. Um, there's like 100, 150, 200, 250. Right, yeah. So I believe those are actually heavy grips grippers. The captains of crush grippers have like crazy zany numbers that like don't mean anything on them. Um, I don't know if I've ever tried a 350. I'll be honest with you. Um, I know I've closed 300s. I don't know. I can't remember if I've done 350s or not. I definitely don't have them on video uh, that I recall. My memory, dude, is freaking horrible when it comes to details like that. Yeah. Uh, like some stuff I can remember, some stuff I don't. I don't know, man. I don't know if I've done a 350. I can tell you that I've closed multiple 3.5s from Iron Mind, but um, uh, and I would suppose they're probably in the similar range. I have rated 350s, and I think they're you know right there in the 170 to 185 range, which is right about where most 3.5s are. But uh, I don't know if I've ever closed one. I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah, it's still pretty crazy though. Yeah, it's anybody there, watching, you know, Dude, if you guys have used the COCs. Feet. Yeah, that's legit feet. If anybody watching has ever used the COCs, let us know below, like what you're using. You know, it's pretty badass. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we're approaching to the end. I'm just gonna ask a couple more. So, I'm just curious myself because I see a lot of old time strongmen when I when I look at the history and looking at old photos and stuff. You see people like. Uh, you know, bending various objects, you know, uh, pans. Uh, and I'm just curious, obviously I'm not training for that, but I find it very interesting how they could, like, achieve such feats. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about that, about, like, bending pans or, like, bending, like, very strange objects, but... Yeah. Actually, uh, I have a DVD out um, called Braced Bending, which... Uh, covers how to bend like steel braced against your body frying pans wrenches uh hammers things like that um there's a lot of you know there's a there's appreciable amount of technique involved not nearly as much technique as with like grippers um but like because so i think brute strength will get you a lot further um when it comes to braced bending um as compared to grippers but, you know, basically with, with a frying pan, you, you're going to cup one end, one end of the pan with your other hand, with one hand. And then on the other hand, you're going to pinch it and, or uh, crush into it and roll it. So you want to be able to focus as much energy as possible with your grip strength here. But then also you don't want the pan to move at all. You want to keep it uh, completely stationary with your off hand. And then generally that's a braced feet. So your, your, uh, your fixed hand or your anchor hand is against your leg or your uh, thigh in some way. And then also you're going to compress into it with your core strength. So um, I think I've got some videos up on my, um, up on my YouTube that show um, that feat. Uh, I definitely have tons of old-time strongman feats up on my, up on my YouTube channel. Um, I believe yeah, yeah. that frying pans are up there, but um, that's not that's not a really tough feat. You can actually buy. Uh, let me qualify that by saying, of all the feats of strength, frying pans are in like a beginner level. Okay, oh, there's really? a lot of stuff that is much much harder than frying pans. Um, horseshoes, bending horseshoes are much much harder. So that's that's a much tougher feat of strength. So I would not doubt if you actually have the strength to do it. It's just a little bit of the technique that you're not aware of. So um, what you can do is you can go to like Dollar General or Dollar Tree or Family Dollar, one of those dollar places, and buy a really dollar chintzy, Rama, yeah. yeah, buy a really chintzy frying pan or two. You know, dude, they're like five bucks. All right, so like, don't drink um, Starbucks one day. And just put that money towards the the frying pans, and then you can buy oh, a sure, few and, sure. and buy a few and just try it out. Like I like the the pushback that I get is like feet of strength training is um it's too expensive. Well, yeah, 
there is a, an expense in, uh, involved with that. But like, if you don't have the extra scratch laying around, then just don't buy that steak dinner this week, or don't buy that pizza from you know the the pizza place. You know what I mean? Use that right. money to get your frying pans. But um, and then once you do it. <laughs> Once you do it, you'll be hooked on feats of strength, and then you'll you'll find ways to to get extra money to buy steel and stuff like that. It's it's a really addictive form of training. It's very very fun, especially when you finally get it. Like if you, dude, I worked for two weeks on a deck of cards. I had no idea what the hell I was doing, and when I finally got that, I felt like I was champion of the world, dude. Like, wow. Yeah, I was man. gonna ask you about the deck of cards. Like, uh, you ripped the whole deck of cards. Yes, yes. I, Fuck I, shit. I thought it was like, I thought ripping a deck of cards in two thousand and one or two thousand and two was just like a, like a magic trick. I thought it was like a a doctor deck of cards and magicians were doing it up on stage. I thought it was fake, and I found out that it was a legitimate feat of strength and. Um, people were actually tearing plastic coated decks of cards, and I was like, I got, I got to try this. I, I have to do it. In fact, if I'm, I think like the only thing I really wanted to do when I first started was be able to tear a deck of cards like at the bar. You know, go to the bar, take out a deck of cards, you know, rip the deck of cards, and it's, it's a conversation piece or. Maybe you'll get a girl's phone number out of it, stuff like that, you know, or it's just a meathead trick, dude. So I bought a deck of cards at the at the store and it ended up being like a, a really high quality deck of cards. I didn't realize that cards varied, but there's actually a lot of variation in different decks of cards. And usually it goes by the price. So the cheaper the deck of cards, the, you know, weaker the deck of cards. But I bought a really good one. It was like the two dollar and fifty cent deck of cards. That's like the impulse buy, right by the um, checkout counter. And I was like, screw it, I'm gonna do this. Um, two weeks, two weeks, dude. Like, what year was trying this? to? How much what's training that? did you have under your belt? Like what year? Um, was it? Well, this was like 2002, so I had already been training really hard for like four years, like dedicated training. Um, no, I, I, I'm sorry. It was 2003. And the reason I know is because I still have the original video, dude. The very first video that I put up online was of tearing a deck of cards. It was 2003. I was all sucked out from cutting for that first strongman competition in August of 2003. I was like 215, 220. Wow. I looked like a little kid, man. I looked like a little kid. Um, <laughs> but it was like... Dude, I would just grab them at night in the living room and, oh, a crack! I cracked them! And then I'd just try more and more and more. And my hands would be freaking pounding. They'd be hurting so bad. And I just left them over on a stand in my room, in my uh, living room. And then the next night, I would go and grab them. Vertically or horizontally? Horizontally through, like, the narrow, the more narrower shape. Like, so this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then were once they, I like, did it, in a rubber band, or were they just kind of sorry? Were they in a rubber band, or were they just like no? They were all loose. They were all loose. Okay. Yeah. So with a good deck of cards, well, probably with any deck of cards, but with this particular deck of cards, as I would get it to rip, it would hold like this form, like it was. It, it went from, it went from like this or like this, like straight up and down, to kind of twisted like this. So you could just set them down carefully on the, on the end table. And then they would sit there, and then the next night I grabbed them and I'd start pulling again, and uh, trying to rip them. And then what what I found out was I was gripping it okay to begin with, like it was okay. I could have gripped it a little bit better to begin with. And then as you tear it, you have to make an adjustment. So you can't just grip in the same position the whole time. You have to adjust your grip a little bit in order to um, maximize your leverage on the deck of cards. I didn't realize that when I first started. So I, I was able to progress very quickly with card tearing because I, um, I figured that out. And, you know, I went from taking multiple days to tear it to being able to tear it in one session, maybe five minutes. And then before, before long, by uh, definitely by 
2004, maybe maybe by the end of 2003, I was I was tearing decks of cards in like 10 seconds. Wow. So it's great that you could do that, but the audience wants to know like what's the trick because I know that for the phone book, um, it's kind of like making the W. See, that's a bullshit technique. It's the a phone book technique, technique huh? like that is is bullshit. Like if you like it, it, any any of the old time strongmen that are uh, so there's there's a major guy in strongman performance history named the Mighty Adam, and then he trained a guy called Slim the the Slim the Hammer Man Farman. Slim Jim. Sorry, Slim Jim the Hammer Man. Yeah, that's I don't know Slim. It's just Slim. They just call him Slim. Slim the Hammer Man. Okay. He tra- he trained a guy called Dennis Rogers. Dennis Rogers trained a guy named Pat Povolitis and a whole bunch of other dudes. He's still training people to this day. And then I learned a bunch of stuff from Pat Povolitis. He's one of the guys that I went and visited in 2004 in New Jersey and learned a bunch of stuff from. So as far as my lineage, it kind of goes like the Mighty Adam, Slim Farman, Dennis Rogers, Pat Povolitis, the Human Vice, and then me. So... Um, I guess what I'm saying is people that came along those lines in that, in that, in that heritage and that community, it's like annoying to see people do that V or that W technique, because what you're doing is you're applying pressure to the pages in a way that makes them pop. It's called a popping right. technique. So the legitimate way is called the grip and rip. Um, and what you're doing is you're still positioning the pages in a way that you crack the pages, but that's considered the legitimate way. Like you, it actually requires a little bit of strength to do it that way. Whereas most people can do a phone book using the popping technique, even if they don't do any weightlifting at all. They don't even you don't even really need strong hands for that. So um, then, if you really want to be extreme, um, in my uh, in my phone book tearing ebook i talk about the diesel technique which is like where you where you hold the the phone book out away from you there's absolutely no bracing against your body whatsoever and you just try to tear the phone book like this like you're tearing a piece of paper so um yeah i again kind of went off on a tangent there but like the popping technique normally it's that's why it's good to know about the grip myths you know what's all these misconceptions about everything yeah yeah, it's good to know, that's, like, I mean, source, that's, know what's good and what's not. Right. There's, there's, it's just, you know, it's just kind of a form of trickery or cheating the feet to pop the phone book. Um, with card tearing, there's really no, there's no trick in in that regard. Um, you've got to position them, and you want to try to make like an S curve in the in the in the cards. But other than that, you've you've really got to clamp down real hard. And then it's it's almost like a shearing effect that takes place, where you're moving your hands in a way that you're you're focusing all that pressure into the center of the card so that they'll split and start moving away from each other. Sort of like the uh, if you uh, if you think of like the tectonic plate theory about the Earth and um, how er, uh, earthquakes take place when these plates slide against one another. That's kind of what's going on with. Um, a deck of cards when you're tearing a deck of cards. Wow. All these, all these, it's, it just goes to show how impossible is almost like nothing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, people just, people build these, these, uh, these barriers and these ceilings for us. You know, they just tell us, like, no, nah, you can't do that. Yeah. This is impossible. But just because nobody has ever done it before doesn't mean that, like, it all starts in the mind. You know, Any, everything around us, it's all, it all came from an idea. Mm-hmm. And, um, it just goes to show how powerful the mind is and like this is some stuff that i've been researching a lot like recently about like spirituality and like um some people they they do things in their mind and then it kind of just happens you know Mm -hmm. so some people like like mentally they just think like they already ripped the the deck of cards and then people are are just witnessing it in the physical but it only happened because they really believed they could do it you know right and there was like zero trace of doubt and they just got it done but um it just goes to show how much like certain people, like over time, you know, they're just doing all these crazy feats of strength, and it's just mm-hmm. people are just one, they're creative, and two, they're dedicated, and like they believe they could do it. 
mm-hmm. and all these things that just seem so impossible. Like honestly, I never, I never imagined I'd see someone do that York pinch um, feet. You know, I could imagine like a gorilla doing it, or like you know, some kind of animal. Right. Yeah, like enormous hands, but like an actual human being. Yeah. And nobody who has like, and, and like a, a human who who doesn't have like, um, you know what I mean? If someone's like eight foot tall. I mean, like, ridiculous genetics, like, yeah, it's possible, but, you know, you got, like, a guy who's, like, 6'2", like you, you know, 250, who's just, like, doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, just crazy, like, everybody watching, you guys could learn so much from this Q&A, you guys could learn so much from this guy's channel, Jed, check out his Instagram, so why don't you just tell everybody where, where we could find you? Sure, man, so the YouTube channel is Jed Johnson, J-E-D-D-J-O-H-N-S-O-N, um, my main website is dieselcrew.com and my grip instructional website is the grip authority, the grip um, Instagram is jed.diesel, J E D D dot D I E S E L. Um, I don't use Twitter. Don't worry about that. Um, does anybody use Twitter anymore besides like celebrities, dude? No clue, man. Yeah. Who, I don't, I don't even know. Um, that's about it. I, 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 most of my efforts are put towards my, my website from there. It's, uh, YouTube. And then every once in a while, if, uh, I, I have something that I want to put up, I'll put it up on Instagram, but I don't use it that much. Uh, so YouTube is probably the the best thing that you want to follow. If you're, if you're interested in like some quick info bites, Q and A's, tutorials, and stuff like that. Otherwise, Diesel Crew and thegripauthority.com. Right. Either way, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put all these links in the description box below. So, show Jed some love if you don't already have him on all these different platforms. And uh, overall, I'm super thankful, super grateful to have you on the channel today. I know I got a lot out of it. Hope everybody else who reached this far in the video got a lot out of it. Sound quality could be better, but we're working on it. So, <laughs> so thanks a lot, man. Appreciate awesome. it a lot. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, and uh, um, I'll just close with uh, my my motto is misses are just warm ups. Like if you're yeah, trying yeah, something yeah. out and you fail one time, you can't just give up. You gotta you gotta try again because there's been times where I've tried things out, you know, half a dozen, even a dozen times, and failed every single time in my workout, and then on the twelfth or thirteenth attempt, I ended up getting it. And right, like right. I said earlier, you know, strength training, you have to deal with failure sometimes. You cannot give up just because you failed a few times. Mm-hmm. The time that you're going to be successful might be just around the corner. Um, and never say no to a new PR. Don't just give up on stuff. Don't get in the habit of giving up and giving in. Um, keep on trying and, uh, and keep that mental side of the game going at all times you can always improve upon that and you know i i focus on things that i've never done before and maybe nobody's ever done before but i know i am going to lift those things because there's just been too many times that i was successful where people said that's impossible or i doubted myself in the beginning and i just know now that i will do these things that i want to do i've got some major stuff that i'm working towards and i'm going to reach them so just right, stay right. tuned, brother. It's like the slogan uh, for Nike. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who it's for, but <clears throat> they take the word impossible and they just split it into two. And it's impossible. Yeah. I like that a lot, too. But, yeah, it's all in the mind, man, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you, think, sure. if you don't think you do it, you're never going to make it. It's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, man, yeah. for having me. And uh, I know that we went through some technical stuff, but... Uh, I, I do appreciate you uh, having me on and uh, can't wait to see what else you come up with down the line. And I know you're going to continue to improve the whole process. So uh, good luck with everything and in, in your endeavors as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'm just working my coach right now. I'm getting uh, my body like uh, back at the proper alignment, improper, improper training and stuff like that. Surgery, like a knee a couple of years ago, but uh, everything's coming back into place, man. I got lots of projects on the way and, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with everything that's going on. You know, I'm really, uh, <clears throat> I like bringing guys like you on the channel to really raise awareness on, uh, you know, different feats of strength and just to educate a lot of my viewers and supporters on the different kind of stuff that's out there. 
you know, stuff that's not too mainstream. Yeah. If, if anything, not mainstream at all. <laughs> a yeah. Bit under, a bit more on the underground, underrated side, but it, it's just really cool overall. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. Really appreciate it, man. So thanks cool. a lot. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. Take, take care, bro. See ya. Ciao.